uh, some difficulties and friction. The Mayor Simcha wrote the famous work Or Samea on the Rambam. It's one of the classic uh, commentaries to the Rambam. Uh, he himself uh, had a very tragic life. He had an only daughter who died, left no descendants. And therefore, for instance, the yeshiva or Sameach is named after him. There are many things that are named after him. But his commentary to Chumash, to the Torah, called Mesha Chochma, so he himself said that uh, as great as he felt in the commentary to the Rambam was, the Or Sameach, he said he will be remembered because of the Mesha Chochma. The Meshachotma lately is having a revival. Lately is coming into vogue and into study. Uh, it's a very difficult book, and the style and the prose is difficult. Rabbi Yehuda Kopperman of the Michlala uh, spent a number of years uh, on the book, uh, writing uh, footnotes to it and explanations. Uh, you could say that he's the redeemer of the book. So he has a number of ideas that, uh, some of which I want to share with you tonight. There's a posit that we will recite in the Seder Kaporos. I don't know if uh, chickens make their way to Efrat or not. <laughs> so the uh, whole minute of Kaporos is a very interesting thing, just as an aside. The Orach HaShulchan, the famous uh, posseg of Lithuanian Jewry, writes that the minute is not Jewish and it should be canceled. And he says any rabbi that will be successful in so doing, he said, I will defend him in this world and in the next. The Mishnah Brura, when he talks about Kaporis, also says at the beginning you know, that it's not Jewish, and he doesn't understand how the minute came, but he's, then he proceeds to give all the details of the minute. Uh, Minhogim amongst the Jewish people are very hard to uh, cancel. Rabbi Yaakov Hemden said in one of his famous quips that it's too bad that the signal is not a minute. <laughs> 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 So uh, the minute of Kaporis, uh, uh, it was uh, almost uh, exclusively with money. Uh, the origin of the minute of Kaporis is uh, Rashi in, uh, in the eighth parrot in Shabbos, where Rashi writes that he heard that there was a custom amongst the Gaonim in Bovel that Arab Rosh Hashanah, they would take a potted plant and plant the remove it from the pot and plant it in the ground and say, this is our kapora, this is our tmura, etc. So that apparently was an ancient mina, and from plants it evolved the money, and from money it evolved the chickens. <laughs> and uh, that's our custom. I, I almost felt that the minute of chickens came from the fact that they wanted to give food to the poor, and they would chef there for many chickens, uh, Arab Yom Kippur, to distribute to the poor. <coughs> and so as long as they were doing an act of charity, so they said, well, this should be our Sfus Liyom Adim, and then the Mino devolved from there. In any event, we say a posset that appears in Tanakh, in Yesh, Malach, Meilitz, Echod, Mini, Olaf. If there is one angel in heaven out of a thousand, that's a maybe that comes to our defense, that says a good thing about the person. So by the human, God will grant grace. And the uh, will be read as shakas, he will be redeemed from descending into the grave into Gehenna. Motsosi Chofer, and I have found therefore a kapora uh, because of the 
this one mob. So I want to ask you, you know, you got a thousand malachim, 999 say, your guy's no good. You got one malach that says, yeah, you're all right, we can do something. So usually 999 to one is a pretty good majority. You're speaking to a rabbi that was once elected 21 to 19. <laughs> 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 so, uh, 999 to 1, what do you mean that uh, by Hunenu, the Rebbe Shalom says, we're going to give him chayim, doheim, we're going to shot us, we're going to redeem him. It really, uh, if you think about the passing, it's weird. So, the Mayor Simcha says, the great insight, he says, what is life? Let's define the Khainu Lachai. Malachofis Bachai, the Khasvainu the Sefer Achai, the Manta the Kimkai. Yeah, wonderful. What is life? So he says that Judaism defines life as potential. Oh Boni Shmoso, Yitka Matsuri Shuoso, he's still alive, he can do something. There still is potential. So until now, he was an awful person, that's true. But he can be a better person. Because we have a rule, mitzvah, goreris mitzvah. A mitzvah drags along another mitzvah. You have no idea. Rebbe said, Bocha Rebbe, and he said, Yesh Kole Olomo Bishor Achas. You can achieve eternity in one moment. One thing that a person does. And therefore it's potential. And then the question arises, the Malach that's maybe it's Malach who says good things about people, says, look at the potential. He could still do something. I remember uh, when I was at Rome, Miami Beach, so I had the honor, and the, I can't describe the, the experience that I had, the Ponovich Arobes, I could talk about the Roth or Basic Ghanaman. There were people who built the Jewish people after the Shoah. Maybe 20 people. The Baron Cutler, the Shotskis, here, uh, the Blazer Yudel Finkel. One of them was uh, the Pot of Israel, who bought his hill <coughs> in Bnei Brak uh, when Rommel was at El Alamein. <coughs> so he wintered in Florida. In Florida then, Miami Beach was far different than what it, was, than what it is today. So then, uh, there were kosher hotels. And uh, the wealthy Jews from all over the world would come and spend two to three months in the hotels. There weren't condominiums and there wasn't Mother of Time. It was a different floor. And I was, uh, I was the rabbi of Miami Beach. So uh, I went to visit him one day in his hotel. And he said to me, he said, uh, you know, you can help I said, how can I help the rope? He said, I need somebody to go with me two times a week, three times a week. I have I raise money for the yeshiva, will you come and get on? I need somebody to drive me. Yeah. So I grabbed the opportunity. I spent all oh, his seven, eight hours a week with him, and it was just marvelous. And he was uh, the world's greatest fundraiser. He could take money from a rock. <laughs> and they loved him when it was over. So I remember we once went to someone who was a very wealthy man. And the road was raising money. He was built and uh, bought the uh, uh, orphanages uh, for uh, children after the Shoah, children after he came after the Sephardic immigration to the country, <coughs> children from dysfunctional families. He had about 300, 400 children. And he was building a school 
schools for them, and dormitories for them. And, and they got older, he, had to, he married them off. But you have no idea what, what Jews were, what Jews are. Not what's in the paper. So he spoke to this man and he said, you know, for uh, $25,000, which then uh, was money, he said, you know, you can build uh, an entire building for me. And look at the merit that you will have. And he really did the job on the guy. The guy took out his check. <coughs> and he wrote out a check. And I was the bag man, so I, I took the check. <laughs> the road never took the check. I looked at the check, and the rock says to me, come on, look at that. How much did he write? So I said, well, he wrote $2,500. The Rav looked at him and he said, you forgot a zero. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the man was taken aback, as I was. The Rav said to him, listen, you have the potential to give $25,000. I estimated your potential. Why don't you live up to your potential? <laughs> God gave you money. Why do you think he gave you money? And he gave him, he, you know, he wiped the floor with him, and the guy added the zero, and he kissed the rope's hand when it was over. <laughs> because he lived up to his potential. There are very few times in life that a person has the feeling that somehow we have lived up to our potential. But that's the definition of life. Kolo, Shmoso, Mo, still alive, something we mean here. Ad Yomoso, Techakilo, we say in Milo. To the last minute, God is waiting. What's he waiting for? God didn't do a good thing his whole life, so what's he waiting for? At the last minute, the age of the Lord of Israel He live up to his potential. Now, potential in our lives is something that we rarely catch up to. But we should know that it's there. Achitzim in It's farther than you are. That was the sign that David made with your own son. If I tell you the arrows, are, the arrows are beyond you, then that's a sign that we're all right. Because of the fact that you're chasing your potential. I had a Jew in Miami Beach, believe it or not, Satra Chosin in my shul, and his uh, application was that he owned a dog kennel and they raced greyhounds in Miami Beach, there's dog racing, and he owned greyhounds that raced. And he used to always say, Rabbi, come, you'll sit in my box, you'll watch it, you know. A dog race yeah. <laughs> Football game, maybe. <laughs> so I always uh, was bishtamet. I always got out. And one day he comes and he says, I know you don't want to go to the races, but come to my farm. Come to the kennels. You'll see how we train them. So then I had no excuse. He was a big member of Jew. So I went. So how do they train the greyhounds? They take a live rabbit and they throw it out in the field and the dogs chase them until they catch an eel. It's a wonderful thing to see. <laughs> <laughs> so at the race, what they do, they have some a rabbit made out of metal. And that rabbit runs ahead of the dogs, but it runs at a speed that the dogs cannot get there. But the dogs are not smart enough to realize that this rabbit, you know, is made out of titanium. It's, they're not going to do anything with it. And that's what makes them run, and that's the race. So he said to me, he said, uh, you know, well, well, what do you think now? I said, you know, that's a terrific pusser shoes. There's a rabbit in front of us, right? That little rabbit, we can never catch it, but we have to run as fast as we can to try and get it. That's potential. <coughs> That's what we are. And people have to feel that way about themselves. People have to push themselves. Uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, the head of 
a school in Muncie. I had a yeshiva for over 20 years. So in every class, we had one student that was, uh, you know, we had 160 IQ. Uh, he had told it to him once. He knew everything. It never worked. It didn't have to. And I would give him the worst time possible. I'd give him extra assignments. I'd be on his back. I tell him, you know, you've got the potential. <coughs> what do you mean? He said, Rebbe, I'm getting 95. I said, you get 95 without working. I'm not looking for that. There were other students that had less natural ability. Now, let's say they would only get C's and B's, but they worked at their potential. So that was something that was marked. So that's how we're measured in life. And we're measured by our potential. That's the life force. So the good angel in heaven says, the 999 say what is, but the good angel says what could be. <coughs> and therefore by them, God is willing to grant grace. By Yomar Kudoehu Meredith Shachatz, we're not going to take them away now, we're going to let it dry. But so see Kofer, I find the Kapora, because there's still potential left. The world of commerce, the world of business, people buy companies that are not at the peak. They buy companies that have an upside to them. There's room. There's some people bought now a Chrysler in the United States for, I don't know, how many billions of dollars. The Chrysler makes miserable cars. It's inefficient. Uh, it, it owes a ton of money. It's got bad labor contracts. So why should anybody buy the, buy the company? The answer is the people who bought the company see the potential. And therefore they're interested to buy it. And the man who bought it, who headed the consortium, said, we wouldn't buy Toyota. Because there's no upside left in Toyota. So there's no room there. But we are, he said, bottom fishers, right? We, we buy things that are weak. <coughs> That's how we make our money. Because there's an upside. There's a potential. So the mouth that sees potential, the emotional also sees coming off of potential. And that's how we should see our children, and that's how we should see our students, and that's how we should see ourselves, and that's how we should see the state of Israel. <coughs> You know, the papers only see the state of Israel the way it is, 999. Everything is wrong. You have to read the paper, you're done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> How many, I can't get out of the seat anymore. Right? <laughs> and everything they write, uh, well, not everything, but a lot of what they write is true. So then why do we go on? The answer is because that's not the whole story. The story is that we have potential. Look what we've done in 60 years. Look what we still can do. Or la goyim de satifa. And you know, your potential to be applied out to the nations. Your potential is what you say, what you say, the school of the school of Mikolo Amin, you're a treasure. Your mamalach is called in the goy kodosh. What do you mean? It's not what you are, it's what your potential is. <laughs> and in heaven, they look at our potential. The Gaon of Vilna says that you have to give Din Vecheshbo. So Din Vecheshbo, the modern day Hebrew, became a duach, right? So everything is a duach. Your accountant gives you a duach, the policeman gives you a duach. Everything's a duach. What's Din Vecheshbo? Din is enough. So the Golan says, and only the Golan can, he says, Deen is on what you did. Cheshbon is what you could have done. So the Rabboni Shalom, who is Bochem Koyos Valet, who knows us, so his Deen is not only on what was done or what was not done, his Deen is on Cheshbon, right? What could have been done? You could have added another zero. <laughs> So 
so you have a wonderful mitzvah, you get $2,500. So that's the big, right? The cheshbon is minus. Because you didn't do what you could have done. You didn't push yourself. And therefore, that's a whole different way to look at life. And it's an entirely different view of everything that exists within us. <laughs> I, I think, especially for those of us that are blessed to live here in the land of Israel, we have the opportunity that uh, our ancestors in Europe would have walked across Europe barefoot in the snow to do it. So we have to realize the potential. And even if we don't catch up to that rabbit, we have to chase it. We're not worse than the dogs. We have to pursue it. A lot of the problem that we have is simply apathy, right? Yeah, look what we do. We can do a lot. We do a lot in every field of endeavor. But a person has to have that drive to be able to do so. I think that's especially true of our generation. Our generation uh, is the tail end, the tail end of the show up. So I was rapidly disappearing off the map. In the non-Jewish world, it's almost non-existent anymore. But even in the Jewish world, and all the attempts at uh, uh, museums and uh, all sorts of things, films, etc., which I myself uh, am also active in, uh, that really won't do it either. Because there's no ritual that we have for this uh, show up. That's the tragedy. We have a ritual for Tishba. We have an Aharachami for the Crusades. Somehow we were able to memorialize that. And this is so horrendous that we've been incapable of constructing a ritual. And uh, standing at attention and for a minute, as moving as that may be, there will come a generation that will not stand at attention. And anything that does not have a halachic framework to it, the sooner or later it does not survive in the Jewish world. And our guilt is that we have not been able to provide that. Politics and all sorts of reasons why, but that's the bottom line. In any event, there's a museum in Yerushalayim called Yad Vashem. And in Yad Vashem, uh, there is something called the Children's Museum. <clears throat> the Children's Museum was donated by a man from Beverly Hills by the name of Spiegel. I knew Spiegel. I knew the whole family. So he was a Hungarian Jew. He and his wife and his five-year-old son went to Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. And uh, ten months later, Eleven months later, he and his wife left, but his son was killed in Auschwitz. He came to California, he came to Beverly Hills, he made a fortune. Uh, they had other children, but his uh, lost child haunted him. And uh, one, in, in a gesture, he gave uh, nine billion dollars to Yad Vashem to construct his children's museum. And the entrance to the Children's Museum on the wall is a picture of his son, his five-year-old son. And he dedicated it to the million and a half Jewish children under the age of 12 who were done to death <coughs> by the most advanced civilization in the world. So you walk in, I'm sure that many of you have been there, you walk into this tremendous room, enormous room, and it's uh, pitch black. It is so dark that you just cannot put one foot in front of the other without holding on to the handle. And as you walk, uh, slowly, slowly your eyes become accustomed to the darkness. And you notice in the darkness, uh, through the genius of the designer, 
uh, reflected through uh, water and metal and mirrors. There's like one candle that's burning in the middle of the room, and that one candle emits mid, uh, you know, an entire series of pinpoints of light that are part of this dark room. And there's a voice over that plays a tape. And the tape is, it reads the names of children. Hein Greenberg, three years old, Warsaw. You know, Sarah Levine, the nine years old, Goldman. <coughs> names, names, names. So when I uh, was in, I would happen to be near Shalim on the day that the museum was dedicated, I saw the notice in the paper. So I said, I'm going to go and see it. I know Stiegel. I've been to Holocaust museums all over the world, so, you know, I'm blasé already. You know, I'm going to see a room full of shoes, I'm going to see a room full of suitcases, I'm going to see a room full of toys. I said, you know, that's it. So you're utterly unprepared for this. And you hear the names, the names, until you can't bear it any longer. And as I ran from the room into the blinding Jerusalem sunlight, for the first time I thought to myself, I said, you know, my name is not on the tape. He meant me too. He meant all of us. But my name is not on the tape. So if my name is not on the tape, then I have to tell I'm here for a reason, then I have to do something to try and help build the Jewish people. I got to chase that rabbit. I have to try and realize potential that lies <coughs> within me. <coughs> because uh, my name is not up to that. That's the Malach Echad Meilitz Miriam. Meshach Kofman says that after a person departs from the world, so then might a haga haga, right? So then if the vote is 999 to 1, then the person is lost. Because there's no potential left. If there's no potential, so whatever it is, it is. Right? Can't do anything more. But as long as we are blessed with life, so then there's no limit to what we can do. And that idea really uh, gives us a different perspective on life and why we ask for life. Because in effect, the Lord says to us, okay, I'll give you life, now what are you going to do with it? I'll give you wealth, you know, because maybe the safer parnos is about God. Okay, so what are you going to do with it? I'll give you talents. I teach in Orsonias. I have a whole cadre of young men who are Bali Chuva, college graduates, many very talented people. So unfortunately, for some reason, uh, it was drummed into the heads of many Bali Chuva that you got to forget about everything that you were before. If you were a poet, you can't be a poet anymore. If you were a an artist, you can't be an artist anymore, you know, the way you were a writer, you can't be a writer anymore. So I think they keep me horse and up because, you know, I'm the, uh, I'm the iconoclast. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm anti-establishment. I tell them, what are you talking about? If you're a writer, you're right. If you're a poet, so let's see poems. If you're an artist, so pay Whatever God gave you, use it. Because it was given to you. And in heaven, there's a din v'cheshbo. Not only what we do, but we, what we could have done. And we have to have the breath of vision and the intelligence to realize that that is how we are measured. That is the correct way to be measured. Meshachopo says another insight that also applies to us uh, very greatly. <coughs> he says there are uh, different types of sins. And what constitutes a sin? So he says most sins are, there is nothing wrong per se with the 
action involved. What makes it wrong is when the action occurs, with whom it occurs, outside circumstances. For instance, one can drive a car on Sunday without compunction. You drive the same car on Shabbat, and it's a sin. So there's no, there's nothing wrong with the action of driving the car. What's wrong with the action of driving the car is when you drive the car, or how you drive the car. He says the same thing regarding physical intimacy. So the physical intimacy is a mitzvah. It's a, it's a holy thing under the proper circumstances. Under improper circumstances, it's a heinous sin. He says there are even murder taking someone else's life. There are circumstances when the halacha allows it, not only allows it, mandates it. A bowl of horgo, somebody is coming to kill you. Ashkeng of our game, preemptive strike, fly over Syria. It's a mitzvah to do it. Ah, you know, the bomb can kill people, you know, okay, you know, that's the way the world is. We are not uh, the turn the other chief people. The turn the other chief people end up being murderers. So, these are sins, but the action per se is not the sin. The sin it is because of the circumstances that are involved. That's the whole uh, concept of halacha in the Jewish life. That's really what the Shulchan Aruch and the Gemara is all about. It describes circumstances. But the action itself is uh, so almost, what can we say, neutral. Morally neutral. says the one exception to all of these ideas is Avodah Zorah. Avodah Zorah is never justified. And not only that, Avodah Zorah is even a person's thoughts. It says the Mount, the Mount Fos as Beis Yisroel Belibon, the Navi Yecheskel says. God, ordinarily what a person thinks about, you're not accountable for it. Even though God knows about it, you're not accountable for it. So we all have fantasies, etc., whatever. But our Hodazara, if you think about a Hodazara, you're accountable for it. You're caught in the trap. The Rambam says a Hodazara is the root of all sins in the Torah. All the lobbying in the Torah are because of a Hodazara. What is a Hodazara? So we think a Hodazara is, you know, an 18-foot Buddha. I remember I was once in Japan when I was the head of the OU. So the, in 1974, when the Arab oil boycott was on, so there was a plant in Japan that the Israeli government, the Rabbanut, wanted to buy glycerin from. You could only buy glycerin made from petroleum. You know, from every barrel of oil, so the top the best part goes for airplane fuel. The next part goes for gasoline. And the next part goes for diesel fuel. And the next part goes for eating oil. The bottom of the barrel, the sludge, is what we eat. That's the food grade glycerin. <laughs> That's what they make. <laughs> it's kosher for Shemitah, but. Uh, <laughs> Osaka, full square city block, brand new, technologically great, and uh, the tank cars of oil uh, come in one end of the plant, and the tank cars of glycerin come out the other end of the plant. And the tall pipes, you know. So I spent two and a half, three hours in the plant with the chief engineer and everything. We saw how to make up the, the system. Uh, how we could check the tank cars to make sure that everything was fine. Good time. It's all over. He says to me, Rabbi, you have a few minutes? That's the only time in the Nosek so why not? So we go across the street, he says, to this beautiful park, in the middle of the 
this park is this fearsome statue of the Buddha. And like, absolutely fearsome. And the Buddha's got eight arms. So he says to me, you see that? He says, that's my God. He has eight arms. I look at him because he's not sure of mine. He's naked, right? He can have 28 arms. He can have one <laughs>
we only need two rows of seats in short, the back row and the front row. <laughs> the others are superfluous. Because there are people that sit in the present company excluded. <laughs> there are people who sit in the back row and see how humble I am. I'm sitting in the back row. In the famous incident with the Hassam Sofer, that all the rabbis of his time in the 19th century in Central Europe uh, would uh, sign their letters, Mimedi Hakota. I'm a small person. As a sign of humility. But it became uh, standard. And there was a man that uh, wrote a letter to Hassan Sofer. And he signed it in many akotam. The Hassan Sofer says, Look who thinks he's a cotton also. <laughs> <laughs> he also thinks he's a cotton. So there's a false humility. And there's a line there, therefore, you have to be sensitive to that line. But basically, there's no limit to humility. Because the opposite of humility is arrogance, and arrogance is a little zone. And that's why the Talmud says that a person that's arrogant, the Rabbon Shalom says, I, he and I, we can't exist in one room together. There's no room for God. Humility doesn't mean that I reckon that I'm a, you know I'm a rag and I don't recognize who I am. Moshe knew he was Moshe. But humility is an inner sense that a person has that it's not really him. And the entire thrust of educating children and of life itself, when a child is born, we're narcissistic. And it's only one that counts. I don't care about my parents. I don't care about them.
don't speak to us, that speak about perfect people. Well, except for rabbis, I don't know any. <laughs> he was four years old, he knew Shas, and you know, and I thought, well, I'm who, where, what's that to do with me? I'm more older than four, and I still don't know Shas. <laughs> so they don't become a role model for us. Was a fantasy. So he told me as follows. The Mora says that Kohanim has a temper. Kohanim has a temper. They have a temper. They, they, uh, the Jews joke about it is because they wash their hands and they never give them anything to eat after. <laughs> Kohanim are not, you know, they're, they're high, strong, sensitive people. Holy people. So they have uh, my father told me, so sometimes things happen in the house, or people from the community came, or incidents happen. So the whole time would feel himself becoming angry. When he felt himself becoming angry, he would stop and excuse himself from the conversation. And he'd walk into the corner of the room and he'd talk to himself. And you said, you're Israel mayor, you're getting angry. Cops, it's going to help you. If you get angry, it's going to be better. And he would talk to himself. So he talked it out of himself. It was a catharsis. When he talked it out of himself, <coughs> he went back and he finished the conversation. <coughs> so to me, that's a story that everybody can relate to. That's a tremendous tactic. Before I made Aliyah, so I had in my desk about a thousand letters that I had written to people, the synagogue presidents, other rabbis, but I never mailed them. I wrote them, but I never mailed them. So I felt better and uh, never, never, never reached the light of day. I burned them all. One has to be proactive uh, to avoid anger. Because anger leads also to the Zorah. Don't make it, he will have a God. And everything that we stand for is against the Zorah. Built the Lashem Levada, only God, the only one that we need. So the Meshachotma points that out. And he says that that's what we say on Yom Kippur to Rabboni Shalom, Arei Ani, quoting the famous uh, prayer of Rabbi Munder in the Gemara, Arei Ani, Yichlim Bole Busho Bechlima. So he said, what does it mean? I'm full of Bole Busho Bechlima. I'm ashamed. He said, I'm ashamed of myself that I got angry. I'm ashamed of myself that I'm arrogant. I'm ashamed that that's who I am. Because I could be better. I know I could be better. I know I could chase that around. And therefore, by saying I know I could be better, so that God says, okay, so we'll write you in this year and let's see if you get better. You're entitled to the chance. There's an upside. There's potential. And that is the greatest extent of the message. Not only that Sarah's made Shuva in these holy days, it's the message regarding life <coughs> itself, and I certainly feel that from the bottom of my heart, that it's the message regarding our state, regarding Eretz Yisrael, regarding the Torah, regarding everything. And that there's a tremendous upside here. We're buying in cheap, we're buying in at the bottom. But we have to create that upside. And in so doing, then we will also fulfill our purposes in life. And the Lord will see to it that His blessings descend upon us. I want to wish you all a Gemara Hatina Tava. God should bless us with a good year, give us peace and security, prosperity and health. We should hear good news one from another. <coughs> the fraud should continue to blossom and grow. We should be 
Dex, hold on. Wait. Okay, we are ready. Easy, my come. אחד ואחד שהגיע לערב הנפלא הזה, לפני שאני אתחיל עם כל הברכות והלאה והלאה, כמו שראיתם, קיבלת כמה, אני לא יודע אם זה מחמאה או אם זה סימני שאלה מהחברים שלי. למה אני כל כך איזי איזי? אני צריך להיות מאוד לחוץ, אני צריך להיות בוטרדת, כי הכל הולך איזי איזי. אז בעצם, ברוך השם, זכינו לבת מצווה הרביעי והאחרונה שלנו, ואחרי קצת ניסיון, אז יודעים שבת מצווה זה דומה לחתונה, אבל זה לא בדיוק אותו דבר, אבל אני לא אגנוב את מה שעליזה צריכה להגיד, אז... אני מאוד שמח שכולם כאן ונתתי לכם צ'אנס לאכול משהו וגם לשמוע את המוסיקה הנפלאה של מוישה בוימו והצוות שלו וגם הבנות עשו את מה שהם רצו לעשות אז בלי ללחוץ על הקלטת הבת מצווה אני רוצה לקרוא לבתי עליזה לעלות לבמה אולי... אלוקינו שבשמיים ובארץ. חכה לטוב, אתה דואג לכל פרי עצמך. אהבה שלך מעברתי אהבת עולם. מודה אני על שנות נעוריי המאושרים. נתת לי מכל טוב אב ואם, אחיות, וגם אח. נקרים לצידי שמניחים אותי בעצה, באהבה ובעזרה. אבי שבשמיים הנחה את ליבי לבחור בדרך הטובה. ולא לעשות מהדרך הישר. כשאחותי התחתנה, 
מישהו סיפר לנו על שתי אחיות שבאו לסגור שתי סמלות קלה ושתי זוגות נעליים וכולי. הם החליטו לחגוג את החתונה ואת הבת מצווה בערב אחד. אני חשבתי שזה ממש מצחיק. אני עדיין חושבת. אבל עצם הרעיון של ילדה שנהיית בת מצווה מתלבשת ככלה, ככלת הבת מצווה, משך אותי לחשוב. מאיפה זה הגיע, המונח כלת הבת מצווה? הרבה פעמים אנחנו משווים את מעמד הר סיני לטקס החתונה שבין איש ואישה. וכך אני מבינה, וכך אני מגיעה להבנה יותר עמוקה. בעצם כל אחד מאיתנו חווה את מעמד הר סיני בימינו היום. ראשית, מקבלים עול מצוות של נעשה ונשמע. אני היום בת 12 ומוכ... ומוכנה לקבל על עצמי את כל המצוות. את אלו שהוריי למדו אותי כבר מגיל צעיר, את אלו שעדיין לא למדתי, את אלו שאני מבינה ואת אלו שלעולם לא. אני מוכנה לעשות ואז לשמוע ולהבין. ובעזרת השם שנית אזכה לקיים את חלקי השני, החלק של מעמד הר סיני. ותהיו בזמני. החלק של החיבור הנפשי, הרוחני והגשמי, והגשמי. החלק שבו הקדוש ברוך הוא ישכון בתוכי, ביני ובין בעלי. אבא שלי תמיד מזכיר לנו בכל רגע גדול בחיים שלנו, שזה רק ההתחלה. זה תמיד ההתחלה, ובכל התחלה צריך גם לזכור את, הרגע, את הסוף של הרגע הגדול הקודם, שהרי בזכות אותו סוף יש אפשרות להתחלה חדשה. Um, and now I'd like to say a few words in English. Thank you, Hashem, for everything, for everything you do and give me. I'd like to thank my parents for this amazing, amazing party. Yeah. And wow, am I enjoying myself. I hope you are, I hope you too. Also, for all the help and support, all my life, I love you, and I love you so, so much. To all my wonderful sisters and fantastic brother-in-law, I feel so lucky, you and Tanya and Michal, Zahava, you always help me, and especially for tonight. My speech, the invitations, scrapbook, my hair, the necklace, the decorations, and all the schlepping. Tonight is your ears Hebrew birthday. So let's all drink to the party. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Hey, yeah, hey, Thanks to Granny Ma. for being here. You always add so much to us in class. And we're so excited to have you here. We love you so much. Yeah, yeah. We're so sorry Ma could not be here with us. It's really difficult to have a simcha without her. We really miss her so much. We love you all. Seda and Grandpa Barnes, you were not Zaycha to be with us tonight. We're so sorry. It was Zaya's and Ma's dream to put, to put in this magnificent garden to, together tonight with, with Alan Paz. They planned and planted. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> It was Zaya's yard site this past week. I hope he's looking down and seeing us enjoying the garden. the garden's beauty, and having such a wonderful simcha in the garden he, always, he wanted so much. I hope, I hope I give him nachas, now and always. Auntie Linda, thank you so much for flying in especially. We love you so much. You never missed... <laughs> Meanwhile, you never missed one of our simchas. We really appreciate it. To all our Israeli family, Les, Lucy, Shirani, Tippi, Ruthie, Yair, Sarah, Shlama, Ellie, thank you for your unconditional support 
and love. We're so we're so lucky to have you here. Thank you, Ruthie, for the delicious cheesecakes. Oh, it's so amazing to have my cousins, Aaron, Masha, and Daffy, and Abby, and Alan. You're all so special to me. I really miss all the aunts and uncles and cousins who could not be here. Thank you all for coming from far and near. Please enjoy yourselves. Good. Okay. Now you can all understand why she's called Eliza, because Eliza means joy, and she's always been a bundle of joy to both Hazel and myself and to all those who know her. We really have a lot to be thankful for, for, for her and for all the people who, who played such an important part in being here. We thank each and every one of you who've come from near and from far and from even further to our family and to our friends from here and from all around. I think, oh, Maria's giving us a mention from next row over there. Absolutely. Um, before I call upon my young couple, um, I'd just like to also mention special thanks to Maish for the hours and hours that Hadassah was prepared to let him help me out over here. To John Goldberg for helping us with the um, finishing touches in the garden over here. <laughs> for Joni for, and her team for her delicious, delicious catering. For, for Rebecca for her fabulous pictures. And if anybody wants to see how she does a wedding, phew, you can't believe it. Um, for Liz, doing his video job as usual. Tamara Kowalski, you'll see her, we her wedding cake. Her bat mitzvah cake in the corner over there afterwards. And especially to all our wonderful, wonderful neighbors and friends who continue to, to make sure that any simcha is, is a community simcha. And we really, really appreciate everything that everybody does. Okay. okay. And my wife ma wanted me to make a special mention as to, you know, they say, unfortunately, we... Only half my siblings are here. Les and I are here, and my brother and sister are in South Africa. This afternoon, this evening, both Michael and Corin phoned, and they sent everybody muzzle and brocha. And a little bit earlier on, uh, David and Mindy called from the States, and we really, really appreciate it. And however much we, we love our brothers and sisters, we prefer to have them as close as our neighbors. And since we're talking about neighbors, we need to also thank especially Libby and, and in fact everybody in the block because they put up with us. And they, in, sometimes they'll even put up with Maria. <laughs> Have I been speaking too long? All right, I'll call Tanya. Okay. Well, I don't think I could ever speak without mentioning my grandfather. And what's a better way, uh, as in through his uh, sense of humor? So, for the next 10 minutes, my job is to talk and your job is to listen. If you finish before I do, pick up your hand, I'll catch on fast. <laughs> Anyways, that's it. Is that Zeta for you? Yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to focus. Aliza has so many mirrors that uh, I have so much to learn from her. My teachers always said, like, Mirav, me, me, and I was like, okay, now I'm going to talk a But um, it's unbelievable how much I learned so much from my, from my younger sister about life, about the zest for life, the happiness. Like, it's unbelievable. There's a story about the Baal Shem Tov who sent his, uh, one of his chassidim, Reb Nachum, to the city of Broad. He, said, he, he sent him to, set, to collect money for these three orphans for their wedding. 
and he sent him off. Now Reb Nochum came to Broad, he was so excited, he felt so privileged that the, the Baal Shem Tov asked him to collect the money. And he started going from house to house. But after two weeks of collecting only but 10 rubles, he was so broken. He sat down and he was so upset. He sat down and started crying. He said, Hashem, I don't understand. If this money was for me, I would understand, you know. If you don't want to give me the money, I would understand. But this is for these three orphans. This isn't even for me. It's for your sake. It's for your name. He was so broken and so upset. And as he sat down and was crying there, he suddenly hears the singing and dancing. He picks up his, his, pick, he, he picks up his head and he sees this Yedele dancing around and singing. He, uh, this Yedele was obviously a Ganav because he was held by these two big policemen holding him down. So he comes up to this Jew and he says, what's your name? And he says, don't you know who I am? I'm Moshe Le Ganav. I'm the most famous Ganav around. Don't you know who I am? And he says, sorry, I'm not, I'm not from around here. So, you know, I'm sorry. But you know what? I bless you. That please God, when you get out of jail, please God, you'll stop stealing. You'll stop being a Ganav. So Mashallah looks back at him and he says, what are you talking about? A Jew never stops doing what he began to do. Now, I'm not teaching anyone to stay a Ganav. Please God, if, uh, if someone steals, I hope he stops stealing. But there's, there's a much deeper understanding that we could, we could all understand from this uh, story. Oh my gosh. Forgot the ending. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so the the Moshe Leganov doesn't matter. I'm coming it up. It's okay. Moshe Leganov. <laughs> Anyways, Rabbah understood what the, understood the message, and he went off, and he went and collected the money within a week. He got all the thirty thousand rubles. He ran up to the base midrash of uh, he he got to the base midrash of uh, the Baal Shem Tov. As he comes into the base midrash, the Baal Shem Tov comes up, comes up to him and he says. Rabbarach, Rabnacham, how is it, how was it to, to meet um, Eliyahu Anavi? So again, there's two things that I wanted to learn from this story. And the one is that a Jew really never stops doing what he began to do. And the second is that anyone, anyone, any, any Jew, you could learn from any Jew. Any Jew could be an, an Eliyahu Anavi. Anyone you meet could be that Eliyahu Hanavi, that messenger from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to send you that message that you need to hear at that moment. So we should learn and understand that we could really, really learn from everyone. Now the thing about a Jew never stops doing what he began to do, I learn a lot from Aliza. I mean, besides for cleaning up her room, she really doesn't, she always finishes what she began. And... Uh, she really, like, there's an example about a year ago, I think, uh, something, whatever, her school had this project that they were all, like, uh, collecting money for some cause, I'm not sure. Hope this doesn't embarrass you. Anyway, 